Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Magnus the Red. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. If you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. I'm the bad guy? How'd that happen? Magnus the Red, Master of Prospero, A. K. A the Crimson King, the Sorcerer King, Cyclopean Magnus, the Red Cyclops, the one who did nothing wrong, my special Magni Magic, the Saucy Spice Boy, Wide Ariman, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Primarch, is the Primarch of the Thousand Suns and rules over the planet of the Sorcerers, and formerly Prospero. He is directly after the Emperor as the mightiest Sicker Sorcerer in the whole Warhammer 40k universe. He is notable for having an enormously variable physical form with a few common themes he keeps to most of the time, red skin and hair, one eye, etc, and being enormously, staggeringly, almost unbelievably arrogant, and with his shifting physical form and his hubris he's a real chip off the old block. Because of this there is debate over if he had a big ol' red eye in the middle of his forehead, or had normal eyes but one socket was empty, older fluff had the former and more recent fluff the latter. Either way he was a cyclops, the color of his single eye is also described as constantly changing. He is also the primarch of the blood ravens, maybe, which would explain their color scheme, high percentage of sickers, their chapter badge, their name, their beliefs, and they're stealing everything that isn't nailed down, who are we kidding, including what's nailed down as well, and the nails with that. Of all the Primarchs, with the exception of Vulcan, Sanguinius and Jagate Khan, Magnus was one of the most open-minded and compassionate of the discriminated, being a sicker and all. He, along with Old Morty, are among the few traitor Primarchs who actually hate despise their respective chaos gods. Mortarian for his general disdain for all things psychic and nature, and Magnus for being humiliated and played like a damn fiddle bite singe. Then again, being a demon prince does make even the idea of doing so impossible by definition, so instead he's chosen to blame the Imperium for pushing him to the side of the traitors. The Great Crusade. Magnus landed on the planet of Prospero, a planet whose ancient civilization was composed predominantly of sickers who had fled there because they were persecuted by humanity at large for being sickers. As Magnus was himself such a being, he formed a kinship with the people of Prospero in short order. Taken in by Prospero's people, he absorbed knowledge like a big red sponge, and became crazy powerful, and in time far exceeded the power and control of all of his teachers. After a while, he became the single most powerful thing on the fucking planet, and he led a campaign to eradicate a race of predators on Prospero known as the Cycnoin, which had overrun many of Prospero's early cities, and had an unhealthy fondness for laying their eggs in unsuspecting sickers' brains. Which was probably why the beasts had destroyed the entire population of Prospero, save for its capital city, Tizka. One by one, bit by bit, Magnus forces retook the planet, putting the Cycnoin to the sword, and within a year, Magnus had mostly reclaimed the entire world, except for the desolation of Prospero, which was everything except for Tizka. Once the campaign on the Cycnoin was complete, Magnus became the planetary leader by popular demand. Magnus decided to be fucking awesome, and rebuilt the cities, or mostly just Tizka. Like a somehow perfectly stable fortress lasting some 50 years in Dwarf Fortress, Tizka became arguably the most beautiful city in Imperial space with crystalline spires and pyramids, long marble roads, and psychically resonant crystals in key locations, designed to calm the turbulent minds of younger sickers and help them control their burgeoning psionic potential. The city quickly became known as a shining jewel of humanity, and one that showed proudly how far its citizens had come from the brink of near extinction. Prospero also had one of the most technically advanced defensive networks in the Imperium, all of which was hilariously wasted except for the shields when Magnus, in a fit of Primarch scale angst over his eye screwed everything dad was doing and failed my purpose entirely in the process hoopsie daisy, decided that the space wolves should get the rabbit punch. All this time, 
Magnus continued to codify and systematize everything he could about the great ocean the name the Prosperans had given the warp. Huge libraries filled with knowledge about psychic powers in the warp were established, and Magnus himself used his powers to peer into the Empyrean itself, claiming many of its secrets, though at terrible risk to himself. While this was exceptionally dangerous, much of what the Imperium's Inquisition currently knows about the warp came directly from several of his manuscripts that survived. With such a powerful mind heading into the warp, it was inevitable that the Emperor, who happened to be out and about the galaxy looking for his lost sons, would eventually take notice. So he eventually came to Prospero, and he and Magnus psychically prophesied before talking for several days. The Emperor taught him even more about psychic powers, but cautioned Magnus to be slow and purposeful. The Emperor was well aware foul horrors lurked in the warp and liked nothing better than forcibly sodomizing an unprepared sicker soul, but Magnus didn't care, especially since his forays into the warp to save his legion from the flesh change had already come at a price neither of them realized, Magnus believed he'd only given up on his right eye sacrificed Ayla Odin when he had consorted with warp entities whose nature he did not understand. To Magnus, one eye was was an acceptable price and he didn't heed the Emperor's warnings as he believed he'd come out on top of the bargain. Magnus was put in charge of the Thousand Sons, but would not immediately embark on the Great Crusade, since many of his legion were sickers, and there had been so many small mutations that a number of them couldn't survive the gene seeding process. Even worse, during combat, Sickers ran the risk of losing control of their powers and underwent flesh change, where their body mutated rampantly out of control at all the warp energy running through them. We call them something else, but won't speak its name as. Wait, I didn't say it's Marshall Shoros and Tools. Close bracket. Magnus was aware of the mutations his astarts were suffering, and entered the warp to seek answers about the cause of this and if a cure existed, though he didn't know that he had consorted with Sinch by doing so, and the god of justice plan saw a lot of potential in this one. In return for knowledge and a way to stop the flesh change, Magnus lost his eye so hard that he never saw it coming. Ah ha ha ha. Dot. In any case, because of the setbacks that had befallen the Thousand Sons, the selfless efforts of Magnus to save them, their shared cyclic talents, and the continuing distrust and persecution of many Imperial agencies and other Space Marine legions towards the Thousand Sun's use of cyclic abilities and the rampant mutations present in their gene seed, the Primarch and his astarts developed an extremely close emotional and psychic bond. One of the strongest among all Primarchs and their Space Marine legions, exceeding even the Lunar Wolves' dedication to Horus. Finally, about midway into the Great Crusade, 100 Terran years after it had begun, the now stable Thousand Suns Legion, although numbering only 10,000 soldiers, with Magnus leading them on the field, were permitted to take part in the campaign as part of the 28th Expeditionary Fleet. And it was glorious. When they were deployed, the Suns were a sight to behold, flinging psychic storms to consume their enemies and striking bolts with precision and prescience using their abilities to ascertain enemies weak points. Magnus was unique among the Primarchs in that he would always try diplomatic routes first, however, in this way, the Thousand Suns won many battles without so much as a shot fired. This did not sit well with Rogaldorn or Jerleyman, who viewed this approach unmanly. Likewise, Magnus drew constant distrust from Mortarian and Lemon Russ, who distrusted the Sun Sorceress ways and were somewhat concerned of a tray the Suns had picked up. After conquering or annexing a world, they would take huge amounts of knowledge, books, scrolls about forgotten forbidden lore, and ancient artifacts, back to Prospero for study, analysis and codification. And this doesn't sound like the Blood Ravens, you say? Nicking everything shiny that's not nailed down? Point is, nobody looted so prolifically as the Thousand Suns. The White Scars and Blood Angels aligned themselves with them to rig the Librarium. What that did was to actually impose some restraint on Sickers, that made everyone a bit more accepting towards them. Their worries only intensified when it was discovered that the Suns had little warp critters, familiars, cool tootleries buzzing around them and acting as warp power packs. This elegant EG gentleman believes Magnus Tutelary was an adorable warp kitten. When diplomacy didn't work, the Suns were known to fuck entire armies with lightning, fireballs, Mass mind control, 
precognition of enemy strikes and counter them with precision strikes, dealing so much devastation with only some few squads of marines. Magnus himself once fought Orc Gargans by himself, and despite being able to zap, melt or transmute their hulls with just the power of his mind, he instead scaled himself to the size of a Warlord class titan, and beat the shit out of them with his bare hands. A very important event called Council of Nikia or the Trial of Magnus the Red, took place about 50 years before the Horus Heresy, where Magnus was called by his brothers and the Emperor to answer for abusing his powers and to install some form of control of sickers used in battle across the galaxy. Magnus attended the council without any forewarning that it was essentially going to be a trial of him and his sons. He thought, somewhat naively, that it was to be a conclave in which he would be able to extol the virtues of sickers to an open-minded audience. Unfortunately, despite his towering intellect, Magnus was oddly solipsistic. This lack of self-awareness left him blindsided by the fact that he'd actually managed to piss off quite a few of his brother Primarchs with his dismissive arrogance and open displays of warp fuckery. The fact that the sons were obsessed with preserving valuable knowledge, whatever the source, sat poorly with many of his brothers as well. The Thousand Sons' political opponents among other Astartes legions found hoarding Xenos artifacts useless and counterproductive to the goals of the Great Crusade, which actually more or less sought to eradicate all alien life in the galaxy. Magnus was forced to defend his and his son's actions, and unfortunately managed to make a bit of an ass of himself. Instead of attempting to compromise with his detractors or displaying any sort of humility, he vehemently defended all of his own and his son's actions, even going so far as to take the allegorical story of Plato's cave and altering it to suit his own needs. Likely due to Magnus' own lack of humility, the Emperor ultimately decided that he had given the Astartes too much free reign when it came to sickers in their ranks. He chose to disband the Astartes Librarius departments and ban the use of psychic powers in combat. The ever-fabulous Jagate Khan Fassa palmed his high forehead, whilst groaning that this was exactly what he'd warned Magnus about. Magnus was ticked off, but quickly realized that there wasn't any easy way for the Emperor to actually enforce this decree without plonking Custode's watchdogs into the Thousand Suns. As such, the Thousand Suns made a show of not using their powers in public while completely ignoring the ban in private. Horus Heresy. When Magnus learned that Horus intended to betray the Emperor and slaughter like half the galaxy, he resolved to use any method possible to warn the Emperor. He claimed that the best way to accomplish this was to conduct a massive ritual which would allow him to project his essence all the way to Terra to warn the Emperor in person. Now, this was almost certainly not the best way to accomplish this, and Ahriman even suspected that Magnus's true goal was to impress upon the Emperor how useful unrestrained sickers could be in the hope that he might reverse his decision at Nikia. Once his essence managed to make its way to Terra however, he found a massive psychic barrier surrounding the Imperial Palace which he could not penetrate. So he made a deal with Sinch again to combine their powers and smash the psychic seal the Emperor had installed to protect the webway from the warp. Magnus simply did not bother to walk around the wall through one of the entrances that the webway has. Unfortunately, this deed completely ruined the webway project the Emperor had been working on for over 9000 years, which would have made the dangerous warp travel obsolete and would unify the Imperium of Man using a human engineered version of the Elder Webway Gate. Big E called Magnus out and banished him back for breaking it and using sorcery to get through the webway. He was so furious that he didn't even listen to Magnus about Horus's betrayal and declared Magnus a double heretic. Magnus realized that the Imperium was comprehensively fucked and that he needed to do all he could to protect it and Prospero. Emps should probably have told his super psychic son about his psychically sensitive all important project that Magnus was destined to operate, but that would make nobody happy, wouldn't it? When Horus learned of this, he was quietly amused. The Emperor ordered Horus to have Russ bring Magnus back to Terra to stand trial for what he had done, and Horus being a dick, quietly altered Russ orders to lay waste to Prospero instead and slaughter the Thousand Sons. As Magnus was already officially a, slightly tolerated, heretic, Russ stoically accepted the order to bring a third of his brothers down. Seriously, Constantin Valder is way more out for Magnus' blood than Russ himself is. 
Comma Russ took his whole legion to the party, and accompanying the Space Wolves were a full contingent of Adeptus Custodes, led by aforementioned Valder, millions of Imperial Army troops and an elite anti-sicko unit, the Sisters of Silence, think a unit of Culexus assassins and you get the general idea. Barring a last ditch attempt to Skype Magnus through Caspar Hauser, an agent that had been brainwashed to visit Fenris and spy on the wolves that Magnus was not connected to, because reasons. Interestingly Russ actually attempted to contact Magnus and his legion several times in an attempt to get them to explain their actions, and even when he was directly above the planet he kept sending Magnus calls to try and get him to just talk to him, but Magnus had put the planet on lockdown and kept denying any contact with the fleet, which royally pissed off Russ. A shame too, if he said fucking anything he probably could have stopped his people from getting fucked. Why exactly Magnus decided to do this is unknown, as it was. Well, just as retarded as all the other decisions he made during the burning of Prospero. Magnus, sensing this and realizing that this had been just as planned by Tsinch and that it has done this to completely destroy both the Thousand Suns and the Space Wolves, decided to counter Dick move the Lord of All Fate. Instead of calling Russ back and peacefully working out what had happened, which would have solved everything, he decided to accept the destruction of everything that he had worked for, so that Sinch's ultimate goal would only be half fulfilled, because letting your enemy accomplish half of what they want and making the Imperium far more vulnerable to Horus is better than making them fail and giving your traitor brother a harder time. Tsinch was richly amused by this. As Prospera burned, Tsinch and Magnus engage in act after act of dickery and counter dickery, with Magnus finally pushed into a towering rage and taking to the battlefield at his capital, crushing his enemies with volleys of mind bullets, forgetting the whole reason he refused to talk to Russ, before he engaged Lemon Russ himself in close combat. The two fought fiercely and Magnus managed to falcon paunch Russ so hard, his breastplate shattered and one of his hearts punctured. Russ was going to die until his two wolves interfered and allowed him to take out Magnus' second eye, and then performed a backbreaker on him that ended the fight. Russ would have died had his wolves stayed out of the fight. Actually, this isn't true at all. The book A Thousand Suns clearly shows that Russ' wolves were quickly swatted away by Magnus, who then proceeds to use some shiny trick I mean, magic attack that harms Russ badly enough to actually make him howl in pain. Only that this prompts the latter to wave his sword around on instinct alone, and it is in that moment that the Wolf King managed to stab Magnus in the eye. Russ actually won the fight on his own, fair and square, even if luck seemed to really be head over heels his Wolf Viking overlord in Spisluck in that moment. Suck it up near it. Tsinge was greatly amused by all of this because it's rare for anyone, let alone a mortal, to predict and out manipulate the plans of the architect of fate himself. He thus made Magnus an offer, become Tsinch's servant and preserve what was left of his legion and homeworld or watch it all burn in a pool of his own blood. Pussying out, Magnus agreed because the thought of actually dying to atone for his mistakes only seemed like a good idea until he had to put it into practice. As a result, Magnus' cowardice ruined everything he'd been working towards and explicitly doing the one thing he'd been trying to prevent. The response of Magnus' new patron was immediate, for once. Tsinch was true to his word. The City of Light was transported into the Eye of Terror onto a demon world. Prospero was destroyed that day, but Magnus and his legion survived. It is unclear when they ended up on the planet of the sorcerers, before or after the Siege of Terror, but Magnus the Red had been so damaged by his battle with Russ and the psychic effort of teleporting to Sorcerius that his soul had fragmented across time and space. The shards represented different aspects of Magnus's personality, all tied to various places and people in the galaxy, one existed in the past many decades before the heresy, and all had different motives. One shard helped the salamanders resurrect Vulcan, whilst another had gone full demon and tried to kill as many knight errants as possible. Ariman and company gathered several of the more powerful shards back together and managed to perform a rubric to bond them back together into a stable form called the Crimson King. Magnus was saved from fading away but effectively become a demon prince and the most powerful of all Sinch's servants. One of the shards, representing Magnus's good side was bound into the dying Ravul Arvida, becoming Janus. 
Magnus originally planned to join the assault on Terra purely to get this part of his soul back but seeing as Janus appeared later in the Beast Arises series, we can assume this didn't go to plan. Though Magnus shows that Perpetuals can be permanently killed by Sicker Power's Chaos Sorcery when he perma-kill redacted. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Magnus had never served Siege willingly, but now had no choice, exactly as Siege had planned from the very beginning, we might think, and now he was committed to the very cause he had tried to foil. Some head scratching does arise a to why Magnus didn't, uh, simply tell his legion to lay down their weapons and try and talk Russ out of obliterating the entire world, especially since Russ was willing to listen, b, take the hair carry option, which would have at least brought everything to an end a little earlier or c, try to confront Russ elsewhere where there wouldn't be a large amount of civilian auxiliar deaths and a vast repository of knowledge the thousand sons had wouldn't be lost. Or D, just go to the Space Wolves himself, since that way he wouldn't take his entire legion and planet down with him. The common consensus is that Magnus was too proud to consider the idea of explaining himself and resolving things peacefully, especially with the brother he had always considered to be an ignorant savage. But this falls flat when you remember that he also could have talked to the custodes if he thought Russ wasn't willing to talk, and seeing as how Russ kept calling him like a needy girlfriend. He obviously was. There's also no reason presented anywhere for why he didn't take any other option presented here, and once you examine the event, it becomes clear this is one of those odd writing issues where the burning of Prospero was written into the law so far in advance as something that happened, that when they actually got to detailing it they forgot to adequately justify it from the side of Magnus and his legion. Post heresy. And so, the Horus heresy came and went. The siege of terror occurred. Horus had fought the Emperor and, spoiler warning, failed, and the traitor legions were driven to the Eye of Terror. However, the Thousand Sons now had to deal with more immediate problems, with their serving of Tsinj, the flesh change returned with a vengeance. Magnus made efforts to stop this, but being a servant of the God of Mutation has its drawbacks and before long Magnus seemed to have given up. Growing desperate, as a Karaman, the chief librarian and first captain, took matters into his own hands. Having lost his brother to the flesh change before they found Prospero, Araman gathered a cabal of other sorcerers, the Book of Magnus, and performed the rubric of Araman in an attempt to stop the flesh change. The results were not what Araman expected, while it stopped the flesh change and further empowered all psychic thousand sons, all non-sika thousand sons had their bodies turned to dust and sealed within their power armor becoming little more than robots needing guidance from a thousand sun sorcerer. Confronting Araman, once his most favored son, Magnus angrily demanded an explanation. Araman basically telling him to shut it did not help and Magnus was about to kill Araman when Siege spoke to him, Magnus, why do you seek to kill my pawn? Which is strange since of all the chaos gods, Siege cares about his followers the least. Once again, Magnus realized he'd had been used. Disgusted, broken, and still really angry but unable to do anything about it, Magnus simply exiled Ahriman from the planet of sorcerers. For the last 10,000 years, Magnus and Ahriman both have labored to restore the sun's bodies to their original forms, with Tsinch ensuring they fail all the while. Though, it is really weird the god of mutation and change would be preventing change and keeping some of his strongest minions in a form that cannot be mutated. Well... I mean he probably could because warp but we've never heard about it. Fragments of Magnus. Unknown to everyone save perhaps Tsinj himself and Magnus in a circle, the teleportation of Magnus to the planet of the sorcerers at Prospero had the side effect of splitting the Primarch's soul into a large number of lesser fragments, many of which might not have even been aware of the split and believed that they truly were Magnus the Red. 
The actual number of fragments is not known exactly, but an allegorical representation of them showed a broken statue of a bird, with some fragments being as small as grains of dirt though the largest piece was definitely recognizable as parts of a bird. The fragment that traveled to the planet of sorcerers was the greatest shard of Magnus' soul, although upon its arrival it was nothing like the Primarch or the Demon Prince Magnus that are well known to the 40k universe. Although it appeared to be Magnus the Red, it has the mindset of a senile old man who was dying. This Magnus barely knew where or when he was at the best of times and was constantly forgetting who his companions were or what Lemon Russ had done to him or his legion. This shard of Magnus spent centuries of warp time, so practically no time at all in real space, fleeing his memories through the warp while being chased by his equerry Ammon who was trying to bring him back. In a moment of lucidity he was the first to reveal that his soul had been shattered, but only by reliving the Battle of Prospero did the Thousand Sons have an idea of where the largest shards went to, so Aramin led a quest to reclaim them and restore his Primarch, gathering enough to amalgamate the Crimson King. The Crimson King, the demon Primarch of Seenshazni exists in the present, was the recombination of several shards as the Horus Heresy went on and by far the most powerful of the Magnus Fragments. His first act was to declare that he would join Horus Rebellion and lay siege to Terra to reclaim his greatest fragment, Janus. He would exile Aramin for the first failed rubric, would later instigate the Battle of the Fang and then spend the next 10,000 years being a dick, eventually fouling up Aramin's second rubric but achieving near complete unification of all the shards. And surprisingly, the only parts that weren't reunited with the Crimson King were all the ones which embodied Magnus' noblest most selfless qualities. Magnus, as the father of the thousand sons and author of the book of Magnus, was the portion of Magnus that seemed to care the most about his legionaries and of his son Ariman in particular. Much diminished, he remained behind the scenes for centuries attempting to subvert the demon Primarch and guide his son Ariman, and by extension the legion, back to greatness and presumably, at a push, back onto the path the emperor intended for them. It was he who inspired Ariman to attempt the original rubric in the first instance since it was actually his own spell. Magnus, the father, knew that it would fail, but the flesh change was overcoming the legion anyway, and the failed attempts would provide Ariman with both the time and the conviction to eventually complete his great work and attempt a second rubric by pooling his own resources with knowledge gleaned from various other fragments, including the Athenaeum of Callimachus. It was also he who influenced Ammon's dreams to seek out Ariman to kill him and undo the rubric and end their brother's agony. While this shard of Magnus admitted he sacrificed Ammon to remotivate Ariman to do the second rubric, he believed it was the proper course of action to save their legion and make Magnus whole without the Crimson King's influence. The end result may have actually cured his legion and father by reuniting the broken Primarch and reversing the flesh change, and allow the personality of Magnus, the father, to assert control over the united fragments and redeem himself. However, even if it had worked the interference of the Crimson King would have caused it to destroy the fragments instead. Ultimately, it faded into oblivion rather than allow the Crimson King to reabsorb it. The great library of knowledge, the Athenaeum of Callimachus actually was a fragment of sorts, but not able to act independently, only providing a link to the stream of consciousness of the original Magnus the Red. However the Athenaeum was corrupted after being discovered by the Crimson King, who attempted to insinuate his own mind into the thought stream and attempt to assert control over Ariman's second rubric result. His dipping in and out of the stream introduced flaws into the spell which would still have allowed the Thousand Suns to regain their flesh but would have destroyed all the fragments of Magnus in the process. A lesser shard was hidden within the ashes of Callisto Eris that was carried around in an urn for years yet was completely oblivious to the Sisters of Silence, the Thousand Sons and one of the Knights Errant, beneath whom the urn had passed almost completely unnoticed. It was only when proximity to the shard of a guru that it awakened, although its motivations are largely unknown because it seemed to be operating under the orders of the other shard until it fused with it. One fragment remained on Prospero, representing his acceptance of the Emperor's judgment against him, this Magnus was stuck in limbo and meditation for a while, until Jagate Khan rocked up to Prospero to find out what had happened. This fragment served up a nice big info dump and urged him to pick a side in the war, and in return Jagate banished him from Prospero. Another became a demon of vengeance that was unwittingly passed from host to host, 
It was thought to be a normal demon. No one realized it was actually a shard of Magnus. It eventually came to inhabit the body of a renegade space marine called Astraeus. This shard saw the Crimson King as a usurper but was eventually consumed after a very quick battle with the Crimson King following the failed second rubric. One returned to Nikia and represented the part inside of Magnus that died when the Emperor made his pronouncement against him. This shard was literally a corpse being clawed at by demonic hands. One represented his warrior aspect and was found on the planet Aguru seemingly waiting to duel whoever showed up. It held off a knight errant, a rune priest, a small squad of space wolves, a bunch of cyber automata and a freaking samurai at the same time without any overt use of psychic power until it was bound into the body of a mortal. Interestingly, this shard had no intention of reuniting with the greater because Magnus was not actually known for his battle prowess. So this fragment would rather have remained and made a name for himself equal to Angron or the Lion. Nonetheless it later absorbed the shard of Callisteris into itself and was absorbed in turn into the Crimson King anyway. Another fragment representing Magnus' desire to seek knowledge for the sake of its acquisition. It was thrust into Terra's past and inhabited the body of King Cadmus, one of the Emperor's enemies, requiring Ahriman to time travel in order to reclaim it. One fragment remained on Terra and was fused by Malkada to reveal Arvida, inadvertently creating an entity known as Ianius, Janus. Yes, the same Janus that would become the first Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights. It is believed that this fragment embodied Magnus's nobility and connection to the Emperor. From the prologue and epilogue there may very well have been a second fragment of Magnus that resided on Terra and was known to Malkada and Rogal Dawn. But where Ravul Arvida housed a shard in his flesh and became Ianius who remained ostensibly a start, this shard was fully formed, an oversized giant with crimson skin, and housed within a villa hidden deep beneath the crust of Terra from where he narrates the novel Crimson King. This fragment took upon himself the role of Archivist of the Horus Heresy, and pinned his hopes for the future on some all-seeing device in the warp called the Orrery. Perhaps building it with the help of his Equariam and while he was chasing a different shard of his emotional father through time and space via the warp, or by completing his own orrery separately, or simply referring to the one the Crimson King made. It could then be this shard of Magnus who rescued the ship carrying the body of Vulcan and guided it back to Nocton so his brother could be resurrected. It may also yet be Janus speaking from an earlier time period before his binding, who knows? The warp is confusing enough without it being inhabited by multiple aspects of the same guy over different time periods. Regardless of whether it is Janus or an entirely separate fragment, one of the Terran shards was believed by the Crimson King to be the first and greatest fragment of the soul of Magnus and so he was willing to lay siege to Terra to reclaim it, even going so far as name it his sole reason for joining Horus' side of the war. By the novel Araman Unchanged. Araman would complete his second rubric and attempt to cast it on Sorciarius. Unfortunately the rubric was not completed as Araman was interrupted by a member of the Thousand Sons who knew that the outcome would result in Magnus's annihilation and wanted to avoid it, so he seized control of the magical energy before Araman could finish the spell and obliterate their father. This resulted in several of the fragments reuniting into the demon Primarch Crimson King and increasing his share of power to a state indistinguishable from that which he possessed as a complete being. The aspect of vengeance, Astraeus would be the Crimson King's first victim and be absorbed almost immediately, while Magnus, the father, would fade away into nothing after having hung on for so many centuries only to fail in his objectives to lay claim to the soul of Magnus or heal his legion all it could do was deny the Crimson King what little power it still possessed. Although he might have actually succeeded, in by failing to complete the second rubric, as a side effect Araman was uncoupled from his destiny and now free from divine manipulations, something that Magnus, the father, had wished for all of his sons. But even then Araman ultimately continued to serve Siege of his own will, so how much of a victory this may have been is up for debate. This means that while Demon Primarch Magnus at the turn of the 41st millennium is in his most complete state and the various schemes of the separated fragments have been put to rest, Magnus is still not whole and likely will never return to his original state due to the loss of significant fragments, in particular, the evaporated essence of the compassionate father figure who set the rubric in motion and probably the missing nobility of Janus, who died centuries earlier in service to the Grey Knights. 
At this point it can be assumed that Siege filled in the remaining parts with himself, cementing Magnus's state as a demon prince and eliminating any chance of his redemption. Post rubric. Battle for the Fang. The unified Magnus the Red, the Crimson King, later showed up on Fenris itself and became the second demon primarch after Angren to get shit done, rampaging through imperial lines and laying waste to everything in his path with mind bullets and raw physical power until the space wolves responded and after an extremely hard fight Magnus phased himself out and teleported all his marines out of the fang after having his back broken once again, this time by Bjorn. While he succeeded in sabotaging an experimental, seemingly successful, space wolf genocide mutation cure and killing an entire great company HQ, the great wolf, turns out wolf in a wolf lord's wolf means warping your hands inside him and ripping his hearts out, and almost killing Bjorn the fell handed himself, he did not finish the space wolves once and for all. Of course, Magnus claimed it was not his goal in the first place. Funny how two out of two demon primarchs to have gotten shit done ended up being repelled by the actions of the space wolves. On the other hand, the wolfies were pushed to their very limits trying to repel the chosen of Tsinge, and they only got off easy once he fucked off after his main objective was finished. Warzone Fenris. Of all the demon primarchs so far seen in the fluff, he seems to be the most collected and coherent, as far as chaos goes. In the trailer of Wrath of Magnus he actually sounded quite composed and at odds with Anglin's blood futebludgered. Or Mortarian's I have Espus Ashma, he told the Thousand Sons in a strong but civilized way to put their differences aside to focus on the goal of destroying the space puppies, and remarked how all of them were his sons, even Araman or any other wayward sorcerer who had gone his own way through the ages and that despite the millennia long past, he still holds Prospero in high regards and consistently fights for his homeworld's memory and people. What a cool guy. During the campaign, Magnus' goal was never to destroy Fenris, though it would have been a satisfying bonus, but instead to make the wolves suffer as he and his sons did during the burning of Prospero, with the Wolfen and their genetic flaw revealed, they would be regarded with suspicion and mistrust. Because the people of Fenris have seen firsthand the horrors of the warp, the Inquisition ordered a massive purge that saw most of the population of Fenris exterminated. Majadia basically got destroyed, Fenris became a partly irradiated wasteland, and Magnus pulled saucy areas into the Materium, as the whole invasion of Fenris also turned out to be a massive ritual for which the Grey Knights killing the populace helped a lot. Yes Grey Knights done fucked up. Interestingly, while Magnus is lauded for his vast intellect he seems to have neglected the insignificant detail of knowing that the space wolves were tricked by Horus into annihilating the thousand suns instead of detaining them in order to take them to Terra as the Emperor had decreed. This order was slightly reinterpreted by Horus and then passed on to Lemon Russ with the known consequences, the traitor legions refer to them as a betrayed for that very reason. There goes split personality for ya. Notably, during the above campaign, Magnus got Mortarian's aid in exchange for the latter taking over Majadia and transforming it into a plague-infested planet. However, Magnus proceeded to backstab Mortarian by arranging Majadia to undergo exterminatus before the latter succeeded in claiming it. Magnus likely did this out of vengeance because he's still salty over Mortarian's role during that little council of Nikia thing, something something best served cold. Gathering Stormbook III. Magnus and the Thousand Sons are found to be lurking in the webway after the resurrected robot Gilliman and his allies have escaped from the Red Corsairs. Gilliman, realizing that Magnus is hoping to use him to sneak into the Imperial Palace via the webway gate, instead detours to a dormant gate on Luna. A huge battle between Gilliman's forces and the Thousand Sons ensues, whilst the two Primarchs go mano a mano. In a rare example of the blue bastards not getting their way and the whole demon primarch thing actually making a difference, Magnus super sicker abilities bring the G-man within a gnat's testicle of actually getting killed before the loyalist cavalry arrives in the form of the imperial fists, the adeptus custodes, and the sisters of silence. The sisters nullify Magnus powers long enough for Gilliman to turn him into a kebab. This somehow causes Magnus to unleash a psychic shockwave that blows him back through the gate. After which some harlequins who tagged along with Gilliman seal it off, stranding him in the webway. Since then, Magnus has been involved in many other major attacks on the Imperium at the behest of Tsinge, 
such as the invasion of the Stygia sector and building an empire for Sickers. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.